Good morning. My name is Patrick Tan, and I'm a faculty member at the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School Singapore, the National Cancer Center Singapore. I'm also affiliated with the Genome Institute of Singapore and the Cancer Science Institute of Singapore. I'd like to share with you today a short presentation on some of the work that we and my colleagues have been doing on applying genomic technologies to understand the molecular basis of a variety of cancers endemic to Asia. So one of the most fascinating aspects of cancer and that we now know from studies all over the world is that cancers in different parts of the world have different frequencies. And this is illustrated in the next slide. Our group has been working on gastric cancer or stomach cancer for the past uh, 10 years or so. What you see on the chart here is a frequency graph or an incidence chart of the top five cancers in both males on the left and females on the right in different parts of the world. And what I've done is to highlight in these different localities in red, the word stomach. So in, for example, if you look on the right hand side of the slide, right hand, uh, you will see that in Korea and in Japan, stomach cancer is the number one cancer in incidence in these two countries, in both males and females. Yet if you go to the left hand side and look at the USA, you'll find that you don't see stomach cancer being so frequent. And so this gives you a sense that there are, there are actually tremendous differences frequencies between different parts of the world in the different types of cancer, and we have to understand this. On another note, another way to look at this chart is not so much to look at cancer incidence, but cancer mortality. And that's shown here. Um, and so these are the top, the most deadly cancers in the world referring to the cancers that cause the most numbers of cancer deaths. Right at the top of the chart is lung cancer, mostly due to tobacco-induced carcinogenesis. But second most is actually stomach acid. So despite the fact that these cancers are Asian-specific or more prevalent in Asia, they're actually a significant cause of global cancer mortality. So deaths due to stomach cancer range between 700,000 to 800,000 in the world. So what might be some reasons for these very striking differences in cancer incidence? Um, and so I think there are a combination of factors. Certainly differences in population host genetics may be one factor. But uh, we and my colleagues feel that a more substantial reason for these differences is that the carcinogenic exposures in these, in these areas are different. And that's illustrated on the next slide. So it turns out that in Asia, there are a number of different highly lethal cancers that are caused by group 1 carcinogens. Now, this uh, group 1 carcinogens refers to a select group of agents, be it biological or chemical, that have a causative link towards causing cancer. And this, I'll just give you a few examples here. So I, to I, to I told you about stomach cancer, gastric cancer. And we know that the vast majority of gastric cancers are caused by exposure to a bacterium called Helicobacter pylori. And particularly in Asia, the strain of Helicobacter pylori that's associated in Asia comes with a particularly virulent form of a particular gene called CAG-A. And that's thought to induce inflammation in the stomach, resulting in setting up the processes for gastric cancer development. But gastric cancer is not the only cancer that has a causative link to an agent in Asia. We know that there are certain types of head and neck cancers called nasopharyngeal carcinomas and certain types of hematopoietic cancers, lip lip lymphomas, that are very strongly associated to a viral agent called, in this case, Epstein-Barr virus. And so 
then these, and I'll be telling you about one of these Epstein-Barr virus-induced cancers later in the talk. Moving on be with, between a bacterium and a virus, we also have cancers that are caused by eukaryotic pathogens. So this is only one example. There are certain parts of Asia where cancers of the bile duct, ordinarily a very rare cancer in many parts of the world. In certain parts of Asia, these cancers are highly endemic and that's caused by exposure to an environmental liver fluke that has a very fascinating life cycle that I also want to share with you today. And finally, beyond the, uh, so this is a test, a bacterium, there is a virus, and there is a eukaryotic pathogen, a liver fluke. There are also certain parts of, there, in certain parts of, of Asia, there are also certain types of urinary tract cancers that are caused by exposures to plants. And uh, this is some recently published data that I also want to share with you today. So I hope that if you while I'll be telling you about four different stories, the general theme is that all of these cancers have known etiologic links. And that's not something that you can say more as convincingly today about some cancers that are perhaps of greater concern to the West, like breast cancer and colon cancer. But I hope if we understand these Asian cancers and understand how these different agents can impact the genome of these cancers, we may one day begin to know enough and extrapolate this to understand the perhaps the more subtle reasons why breast cancers, prostate cancers, colon cancers are highly endemic in the West. And that's the hope. We're still very far away from there, but we are making some strides. And uh, I'll be telling you about uh, these stories now. So uh, the first cancer that I will be uh, telling you about is gastric cancer. And a number of years ago, uh, we wanted to understand the mutation landscape of uh, gastric tumors. And so what we did was a very straightforward exome sequencing study where we uh, took 15 paired samples of a gap from gastric cancer patients. So we retrieved the, tumor, the surgical tumor sample and the matched gastric normal tissue and using Agilent Sure Select captures uh, coupled to Illumina sequencing, we sequenced the coding regions of 18,000 genes, and you can see the statistics here, 76 base pair pattern sequencing uh, with an average coverage of about 100 fold. Uh, we then called somatic variants uh, using standard bioinformatic pipelines, and collectively in this initial discovery series of 15 gastric cancers, we identified about 600 genes that contained at least one non-silent somatic permutation. By non-silent, I mean maybe non-synonymous or inducing a frame shift or a subcolon. And um, some of these genes proved to be particularly interesting from a biological point of view, and these were then taken for resequencing in a prevalence series of a hundred additional gastric cancers. And this was actually done at that time using uh, good old-fashioned Sanger sequencing. So what did we find from this very early discovery series? Uh, this was one of the first studies, so and I'm sure that there are other studies uh, that are coming up. Uh, much larger scale later this year, but we did find some stuff that was interesting. So the first thing that you can do um, is to look at the mutation spectra or the mutational signatures that we see associated with the somatic mutations in gastric cancer. And if you can just look at this chart over here, uh, what this chart displays are the different mutation categories, the sequence context of the different mu mutations for all of those mutations in those 600 genes. And if you look closely at the top row, what we find is that the vast majority of mutations in gastric cancer correspond to the conversion of a C to a T in the context of a CG dinucleotide. And this um, is 
fairly subtle. And this looks uh, smacks of uh, the impact of aberrant DNA methylation in, in causing these mutations because methylated cytosines are inherently less stable and subject to mutation. And if what we know from previous studies from other investigators is that one of the effects of helicobacter pylori infection on the gastric epithelium is to induce very rapid and widespread changes in DNA methylation. So this is not a surprising result, but it is comforting to see that the major mutation category that in gastric cancer corresponds to nucleotides that we can associate with increased DNA methylation, or at least aberrant DNA methylation. However, one thing that I want to draw your attention to is that in addition to the top row, which is the most predominant uh, category, there are also other categories of mutations as well. So for instance, um, if you just go down to the bottom row, you see that there are, there, there are certainly not a insignificant numbers of um, mutations corresponding from TA to CT. And so if you think if you go from the top to the bottom, what you can think of is that this essentially forms a mutational profile or fingerprint associated with that cancer. And this concept of mutational profile will become relevant in the next, uh, in the last two stories of this particular presentation. Um, another thing that you can do when you have these 600 genes uh, that are mutated is that we can begin to do pathway analysis on these genes. And this is taking a page from the pioneering work of Kinsler, Volusin, and colleagues, where they showed that while individual cancers have genes that are rarely mutated on a recurrence basis, if you map these particular mutated genes to pathways, you begin to see commonalities. And what we can uh, do now is to take, take the same idea. We can take those 600 genes that are mutated, and we can map them to pathways. And when we do that, as, as you see on the right, the top two pathways that show up as being recurrently disrupted in gastric cancer are cell adhesion and chromatin modification. And uh, this is particularly intriguing from a number of standpoints. Firstly, you don't see these particularly cell adhesion, you don't see this coming up so much in other cancer types when you use this in sort of approach. And another fascinating feature is that gastric cancer is, is a cancer where mutations in e cacarin that is a major cell adhesion molecule, cause familial gastric cancer. So this is also telling us that for reasons that are yet unknown, the disruption of cell adhesion is probably a major driver pathway in gastric cancer. Now for the second uh, pathway, chromatin modification, uh, that was also quite interesting to us because we, we, we knew that there was an emerging body of evidence that disruption of chromatin modifying uh, proteins um, were turning up to be recurrently mutated in a variety of cancers. And so we took one of these genes that associated with chromatin modification and we subjected it to further prevalence screening. And I'll introduce that in the next slide. So the gene that we identified, uh, that was and also I identified in a similar study from Hong Kong um, earlier this year, was a gene called ARIT1A. And this is a SWI sniff related chromatin remodeling gene. And if you can look at the cartoon in the middle, uh, this is the protein structure of R1A. And on top, where you see the triangles, are the mutations in R1A that we detected, combining data from both the discovery screen of 15 gastric cancers and the subsequent prevalence screen of 100 gastric cancers. And a couple of points emerge uh, from this mutation distribution. First, the mutations that occur in R1A all are strongly predicted to be strongly inactivated. They are either frame shifts or they induce stop codon. Secondly, the mutations are scattered throughout the length of the protein. And this is also reminiscent of a pattern associated with inactivation 
implying that uh, this gene it may be a novel tumor suppressor in gastric cancer. The third uh, point is that uh, su supporting the fact that it is a tumor suppressor, we actually identify several cases where both alleles of RA1E in the same tumor were inactivated by separate nucleation events, so supporting Batson's true hit hypothesis. And if you look at the immunohistochemistry chart at the bottom, uh, what we were able to show is that on the left hand side, if you take a gastric cancer that is wild type of RA1A, the cancer cells express abundant RA1A protein in the nucleus. However, in, on the right hand side, if you take a cancer that is mutated in RA1A, you can see that we lose RA1A expression completely at a protein level, hence again supporting the fact that this is a tumor suppressor gene. Subsequent analysis that I don't have time to show you in this slide reveal that RA1A mutations in gastric cancer are frequently associated with tumors that have features of microsatellite instability and also activating mutations in pig 3 ca um, One of the contributions that our group did to understand uh, the function of RA1A further was to actually generate functional data associated with RA1A. And this is a very busy slide that I'll try to take you through. Um, we were able to, if you just look at panel E, uh, we were able to identify gastric cancer cell lines that were either mutated or had a focal genomic deletion in the R1A gene. So if you look, these are alphabetric SNP6 array profiles. And if you look at the um, chart on SMU5, you can see that at the R1A location highlighted by the red arrow, there is a deletion, a homozygous deletion of R1A. In um, the, we can then confirm by Western blotting on the right hand side that uh, we have two um, RA1A, we have three RA1A wild type cell lines that express RA1A protein, ASD5 to 1, ISD1, and CH. And we have two RA1A mutated or deleted cell lines, SMU5 and Y6 to 6, and those two mutated cell lines do not express RA1A protein. And so we were able to do a put back or knock down experiment. So in panel F, we were able to take the RA1A cell lines. We were able to knock down RA1A using short hairpins. This was done both as pools and independent or non overlapping as in RNAs. And in all three cases, when we did that, we saw an increase in the proliferation rate. However, if you do the same experiment, in SNU5, which does not have R any R1A protein in the first place, we do not see any effect. Again, su suggesting that the increase in cell proliferation is not due to an off target effect. In panel G at the bottom, we were also able to take the R1A uh, mutated or deleted cell lines, put back R1A over express R1A, and here you see the reciprocal effect where we see a decrease in growth proliferation. Um, and on the panel H, uh, where we were able to confirm that there was modulation of various genes associated with cell cycle progression. So on it taken collectively, all of this data suggests that R1A is a novel tumor suppressor gene in infected cancer, and one of the functions of R1A is to modulate cell proliferation. And if you lose it, cell proliferation grows. This is probably not the only function of R1A, and I'm sure that there will be other fascinating features associated with this protein emerging from subsequent functional studies. So the result from uh, this first study uh, that was published in last year, and if for people who are interested, we were able to e extend this uh, in a publication earlier this year, where we uh, did the first uh, whole genome sequence uh, analysis of gastric cancer um, are solved. Uh, we, we know uh, that P53 is by far the most frequently mutated gastric cancer gene. We know that when we do pathway analysis that cell adhesion and chromatin remodeling are driver pathways in gastric cancer. And uh, I've shown you data for R1A. But we, in this same paper, we were able to show similar evidence for another gene called FAT4, which is a protocaturin, a member of a cell adhesion 
um, family that is the normal that the cancer tumor suppressor genes. Uh, so that in effect was a very standard exo sequencing study on the egg and epidemic cancer where we are identified a new recurrently mutated gene in about 10% of gastric cancers. Uh, from a cancer biologist's point of view, this is quite nice because we have, we have now a new gene to work on to, to understand its function in cancer development. However, speaking as an MDPHD, uh, this study in a certain way is also unsatisfying because in genes like RA1A and FAT4, which are tumor suppressors, which are, whose expression or function is lost in cancer development, doesn't really present very immediate targetable op opportunities for therapy. And so the next story I'm going to tell you was um, some work that we did that perhaps is more clinically re relevant at this stage. And um, I will then move on to a study of lymphomas. And in particular, I will be talking about a class of lymphomas called peripheral T-cell lymphomas with a focus on the natural killer T-cell subtype. And this very colorful slide here from my colleague uh, Tan Su Yong at Singapore General Hospital really highlights that lymphomas, even though they all belong to the hematopoietic system, come in a variety of different shapes and colors. And so there's massive heterogeneity under this one cancer type. So what do we know about natural killer T-cell lymphomas? Well, we know that it is an Asian endemic lymphoma. So what we have in this table from a paper in the Journal of Clinical Oncology is describing the different subtypes of peripheral T-cell lymphoma in the first column, and they're listed down here. And the, on the subsequent three columns are the frequencies of those lymphomas in different parts of the world, North America, Europe, or Asia. And if I can just draw your attention to natural killer T-cell lymphoma, what you can see is that in Asia, the incidence of natural killer T-cell lymphoma is between four to five times more than in North America and Europe. And much of this is due to Epstein-Barr virus infection. So again, it's an Asian endemic cancer. And it's also a cancer that we do not know how to manage especially well. That's shown in this slide here. The top chart, the pie chart, shows you the different incidence rates of different types of uh, peripheral T-cell lymphomas in Asia. And I just want to draw your attention to the red segment on the pie chart, which corresponds to natural killer T-cell lymphoma. And you can see that this is actually the predominant peripheral T-cell lymphoma in Asia. And at the bottom is an outcome analysis of the different subtypes. And if you first look at natural killer T-cell lymphoma here, and look at the median overall survival of 9.9 uh, .9 months, you can, see, you, you can see that this is actually much lower compared to the, the, most of the other types of T-cell lymphoma. So this is a Asian endemic cancer, it's, uh, it has high mortality, and what we wanted to understand, working with colleagues at Singapore General Hospital, can we find new targetable opportunities in this very deadly cancer type? So we did the same thing as in the gastric cancer study, but in this case, we actually only performed exo sequencing on four cases of natural killer T cell lymphomas, and the reason why we stopped at four was that a, a preliminary analysis of these initial cancers actually revealed something particularly in, intriguing. We found a, a gene that was uh, recurrently mutated, and this was subsequently taken for targeted sequencing validation in an additional 66 cases. The gene that we identified as recurrently mutated in over one-third of uh, natural killer T-cell patients was a gene called Zac3. And this, uh, this, 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 this finding has recently been independently replicated in the publication in blood. Um, and JAK3 um, was the, the, is a kinase. Um, it's 
And if you look at the cartoon at the bottom, you can see the structure of that tree containing a number of the GH domains containing SH2 region, the pseudo-Chinese region, and the Chinese region. And the fascinating thing about this, in contrast to the mutations in RN1A that were scattered throughout the entire protein, the mutations in JAK3 occurring in 30% of, 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 of natural killer T cell lymphoma patients all coalesced at one of two residues, either at residue 572 or 573. And this was very exciting to us because this pattern where the mutations coalesce in a functionally important domain is su su suggestive that these mutations do not cause loss of function, but rather cause activation of a uh, of the Chinese activity. Hence, in a, in a nutshell, JAK3 may be oncogenic for natural killer T cell lymphoma. So we wanted to understand this further, and so we conducted functional assays. And uh, this is a chart where we took um, cell lines of a natural killer T cell lymphoma, and we on the left hand side, uh, we tested to see if introduction of a plasmid containing that mutated JAK3 variant could render these cells independent of uh, the need to have IL2 in their media for growth. So normally, in, a, for, in order to get these cells to grow in the lab, we have to add IL2, interleukin 2, into the growth media. However, if you can see from the right hand side, if even in the absence of IL2, if we transfect these cells with JAK3, we can see a stimulation of cell growth. And on the right hand side, that we can uh, match that stimulation of cell growth with activation of a phosphorylation of JAK3 and the downstream target STAT5. So, again, this is uh, supporting evidence that these mutations cause hyperactivation of the JAK3 kinase. And because it is an activating uh, mutation, we can then go in and inhibit that with a small molecule. And so this is a, a JAK3, a PANJAK in inhibitor compound that's currently being approved for use not in lymphoma but actually in rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see here, if you just look at the um, top left hand corner, if you you know, for the Western blots, if you in treat these cells uh, with the increasing doses of the compound in in inhibiting JAK kinase activity, you can bring down the phosphostat 5 activity. And if you go down to the chart B, that these cells actually stop growing. And on the right hand on chart C, that these cells actually co correspond to an increase in apoptosis. Um, so, Whereas if you just take uh, the other two cell lines in the KYT, HYT1, uh, you see a similar effect, but remember that in those experiments are done where IL2 is present in the growth media. In K562, it's a negative control that does not depend upon the JAK stat signal in passing for growth. So the take home message from this study using a very similar EXO protocol was that by analyzing four patients, we were able to identify a new targetable oncogenic mutation in a third of these patients. And uh, again, working with colleagues at Singapore General Hospital and the National Cancer Center of Singapore, we hope to start clinical trials in this compound uh, in the upcoming year. So this uh, work was pu pu published last year also in, uh, in Cancer Discovery. Um, so that is a very satisfying result from a, um, a medical standpoint because JAK3 is targetable. And I want to uh, then shift gears now and talk about two other projects where um, the findings I think would resonate uh, with people that are very interested in how do you manage and how do you maximize the use of genomic data, meaning that if I know the complete repertoire of mutated genes or the complete repertoire of mutations in the cancer, are there insights that I can gain from analyzing this data that I might not have been able to by looking at single genes alone? 
which were the first two studies, the R1A study and the JAK3 study. So in this particular study, uh, I'll let me it, it, it introduce to you a, a different cancer called as a cancer of the um, of the uh, bowel duct called cholangiocarcinoma. And in many parts of the world, uh, this is exceedingly rare cancer. So in this chart, it gives you an idea of this, that in most parts of the world, the age standardized incidence rate of uh, this particular cancer is 1.5 in Western countries, meaning that out of every 100,000 individuals, only 1.5 people are diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma. However, in Northeast Thailand, which has an estimated population size of over 20 million people, the incidence rate in, is almost 100 times higher, particularly in the males. So, uh, and this, just to give you a sense of the staggering numbers involved here, uh, we are talking about 20,000 new cases of cholangial carcinoma diagnosed in Northeast Thailand every year, of which between 80 to 90 percent of these cases would actually die within the first year of diagnosis. So, uh, and the reason why this cancer is endemic in Northeast Thailand is because it's caused by exposure to a endemic carcinogenic uh, uh, pathogen called Opistochis vibrinin OV, which is a liver flu. The life cycle of uh, OV that I'll refer to is actually fascinating. It, it re requires three to four independent factors to be present collectively in order for this liver flu to have its life cycle. So just look at this chart here from a publication in the field of medicine. Um, if it, once the eggs of OV get excreted from human stool, they find their way to fresh water where they are eaten by freshwater snails. Once in the snail, the OV uh, changes, it hatches, it, it, it changes to a free swimming form. It then burrows into the muscles of the, the muscle tissues of freshwater fish that are then caught by the villagers and are eaten. And as, as part of their cultural um, habits, uh, the, the dish that the villagers use to uh, eat this particular uh, fish is like a dish called koi pula, which is normally quite cooking raw without cooking. And so once back in the human host, the um, OB chemotaxis with the bile duct, where it lodges in the bile duct, causing inflammation and hence the onset of bile duct cancer. So we wanted to understand the molecular pathways associated with uh, liver flu in induced bile duct cancer. And so in a collaboration with Kong Ken University, the predominant university in that part of Thailand, we, we did exome sequencing, in this case about eight different cases of a liver flu bowel duct cancer. And here's a list of the most frequently mutated genes in cholangiocarcinoma caused by liver flukes. Uh, top of the list is P53, but we also see a number of very interesting other genes that are highlighted in red here. Uh, GNAS is a, a, a G protein signaling, it's involved in G protein signaling, and like JAK3, the mutations in GNAS are activating expressing potential for therapy. We saw recurrent mutations in MLL, MLL3, another gene related to chromatin modification. And quite interestingly, a rec rec recurrent mutations in a gene called Robo2 that previously had only been associated with neuronal and axonal guidance. And um, this was curious to us. Uh, and uh, in interestingly, a, a few months later, the uh, large scale pancreatic genome sequencing project was published and also identifying genes related to exonal guidance, including Robo2. Hence, inactivation of this particular pathway may be of particularly particular relevance to a variety of hepatobiliary malignancies. Uh, but what I wanted to share with you was how were we able to use the complete repertoire of mutations to understand to get new biological insights. And uh, in order to do this, we had to start with a question. And uh, in the field, when we compiled the literature and talked to the pathologists, uh, we realized that there was a very uh, interesting question that of debate in the field related to uh, bile duct cancer, cholangiocarcinoma. 
And that was really uh, what are cholangeal carcinomas more similar to liver cancers referred to as HCC or more similar to pancreatic cancers referred to as PDAX, PDAC. And there was actually pro and con evidence for either model. Um, and so could we use the genetic information from the mutations to shed some light on this process? Um, and what we did, again, was to use the concept of a mutation profile, which I introduced you when I talked to you about the Bantric cancer work. And here, what we did was to compile public data, and we compared the mutation profile of cholangeal carcinomas, the CAs in green, to the mutation profiles of PDAX in red, and the uh, mutation pro profiles of liver cancers. Uh, this was a paper reporting uh, mutation data for hepatitis C related HCC. And what I hope that you can up up appreciate uh, from this chart is that if you look at the different mutation categories and particularly if you look at the pattern, you will see that CCAs in green and PDAX in red always tend to track together compared to HCCs, again suggesting that the mutational process causing a CCA uh, up may be very similar or at least related to the same types of processes con con controlling the onset of pancreatic cancer development. And the fact that we also see recurrent mutations in some of these new families like Robo2, I think is further supporting evidence of that. This can also be seen in this PCA plot where we plotted every individual tumor that we sequenced um, in terms of their mutation profile. And again, the CCAs that are in green overlap with the PDAX that are in red, but the HCCs are apart, again suggesting that there are differences in the carcinogenic process, which is quite intriguing because all three of these cancers, PDAX, CCAs, and HCCs, are all thought to arise from the result of uncontrolled and aberrant inflammation. So the summary uh, from this uh, part, the CCA, was actually uh, the potential of an approach that we can use the genomic data in, in all of its core complexity to get new biological insights. The take-home messages from a, from a biological standpoint is that liver food induced cholangeal carcinomas are uh, disrupt a variety of different pathways, including genome stability, chromatin remodeling, and G-protein signaling. Uh, with the discovery of activating gene mass mutations in cholangeal carcinoma suggests potential for therapies. And by using this multi-gene mutation profile comparison, we provide evidence that the mutational processes related to CCAs may be related to the same processes related to PDAX, and hence therapies for PDAX that may one day be discovered may also be repurposed for treatment of CCAs, which is actually the case today, because the therapies for treating uh, bladder cancers are the same therapies, chemotherapies that are used for treating pancreatic cancer. And, uh, so uh, those are the three stories, and I'd like to end my talk today with a final star uh, a work that was just published, telling you about a, another uh, Asian internet cancer that's caused by exposure to a plant. And uh, first, I, firstly, I have to introduce the plant. The, this is a, these plants belong to a large family of different species, all under the family Aristolochia. Um, there are over 100 to 150 different plant species belonging to this family. And what is of relevance to this talk is that a variety of those plant species have been used in traditional herbal supplements, particularly in China and also in India, for the past 2,000 years. Uh, they've been used and as, as, as constituents for a variety of different remedies for different symptoms, including a weight loss, rheumatism, arthritis, menstrual, relief from menstrual cramps, and so on. So it's, this is a compound that has been part of the traditional Chinese medicine repertoire for many, many, many years. Um, but what we know is that in this particular plant, there is a compound called aristocholic acid, otherwise we now refer to it as AA, that is produced by the plant. And this compound is a natural mutagen. It has the ability to enter cells, bind to DNA, an irreversible DNA adduct, resulting in those 
found nucleotides being excised of, of containing re replication and causing the onset of mutations. And so, um, where does and the fact that uh, when you eat these traditional Chinese medicines, these compounds accumulate in the urinary tract, causing urinary tract cancer. And this is an incidence chart of where we see urinary tract cancers associated with exposure to AA. And you can see that in the, bar, in the red zone, there are a variety of different Asian countries, particularly Taiwan and China, with a very high incidence of urinary tract cancer associated with this compound. In fact, it's been estimated that about one third of the population of Taiwan may have been exposed to this particular compound at one point in their life. We also see outbreaks in different parts of the world. Uh, there was an outbreak in Belgium where 100 women uh, came down with uh, uh, acute nephrotoxicity and some of them came down with uh, urinary tract cancer. And this was because they were exposed to that compound as part of a slimming regimen in the same uh, weight loss clinic. So this is from an epi epidemiological point of view. This is a fascinating story. And what we wanted to understand was the molecular basis of uh, this compound and its impact upon the genome of these urinary tract cancers. And so in a collaboration with uh, Changkung University in Taiwan, we performed a whole genome sequencing and exome sequencing on a panel of uh, urinary tract cancers associated with AA exposure. And a number of fascinating things popped up immediately. The first uh, striking finding was that when we looked at the mutation burden of these cancers, meaning the, the frequency of mutations, we found that there was a very, very high level of mutations compared to other ex external carcinogens that had been previously published in the, in the literature, like melanoma and lung cancer. Uh, and this can also be seen at the, in the, under, when compared to exome sequencing, where we had surveyed a variety of different cancers caused by type 1 carcinogens. And the bottom line here is that the mutation burden more, uh, across multiple different individual tumors that mutations in the AA uh, associated urinary tract cancers on the left hand side seem to be the, the, the highest in the re reported literature. So uh, obviously this result needs to be interpreted further in terms of uh, time of exposure and duration of exposure. We don't have that information, but it does give you a sense of the levels of mutation in these cancers which are very similar to the levels that you see in microsatellite the unstable cancers, such as colon cancer. That's caused by a defect in the genetic machinery causing uh, that's uh, involved in DNA repair. Um, the other thing that was very interesting was that, again, we could look at the mutation context of these signatures. And what we found was that unlike any other cancer that we had previously studied, the mutation context of these mutations in AA urinary tract cancers uh, were very different. In, in fact, that these tended to cause the conversion of an A to a T, whereas in other cases, if you remember, it was converting a C to a G. So this is an utterly unique signature that hadn't been seen before in the literature. Because we had whole genome data for this, we were able to, uh, to, uh, to ask the question, is there a specific context surrounding the mutated A that predisposes that part of the genome towards an attack by AA? And the answer is yes. Um, if you can see on the top bottom left-hand corner, on the x-axis is the preference uh, for the mutated A in the plus one position, and on the y-axis is, is the sequence preference for the mutated A in the minus one position. And you can see that um, if you just look at the minus one position, that there is a preference for uh, T's and C's to precede the mutated A. And you can do this for the minus one and plus one position, and because we have whole genome data where we can sample across multiple different mutation uh, events, we can actually do this in the minus two and plus two position. And the bottom line of this is that the sequence context A, C, T, AGT is the sequence hotspot for the mutation. And so this essentially represents a very unique heterogeneous mutation fingerprint to detect an AA associated cancer. This will be very relevant in the last slide of this talk. 
uh, we were we wanted to understand if was AA by itself sufficient to induce these uh, mutational signatures. And this was important because in the natural environment, in the in 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 the in the real world, you know, human patients would never take AA by themselves, but really in the context of a very complex herbal medicine remedy. So what we were able to do was to take purified uh, human uh, proximal tubal cells. We then treated them for. Uh, with AA for over six months, most of the cells died. But after prolonged chronic exposure, we saw the e e emergence of clones that were AA resistant. And when we did exome sequencing on these clones, in the in, in vitro of the clones, we were able to recapitulate both the preference for A to P mutations as well as the mutated context, hence demonstrating the sufficiency of AA in causing uh, this particular cancer. Um, there were also a number of very other interesting uh, features associated with this cancer. For instance, we saw an, an enrichment of uh, these mutations occurring at the splice sites, um, that suggesting that perhaps the chromatin in these particular genes may be more open, and uh, for some reason that this, that this particular compound may preferentially target uh, splice junctions. Uh, by performing RNA sequencing on these same cancers, we were able to show that these predicted disruptions in splice sites did indeed result in aberrant splicing events, frequency would result in exon skipping or uh, intron retention, and collectively uh, the cancers that are associated with AA all show high up upregulation of genes associated with nonsense mediated decay that one can also ascribe to the presence of many aberrant transcripts in the cell. So in a nutshell, uh, part of the mutagenic process or the cutting process of AA involves the disruption of uh, RNA splicing. Um, and so one uh, final analysis that we did was that could we exploit that signature as a potential screening tool to detect other cancers not previously reported in the, in the literature as being associated with AA exposure. And so uh, we, we hypothesized that uh, in the once uh, a human being consumes an A compound, that compound has to traffic to certain parts of the gastrointestinal into the fetal biliary tract and before it winds up in the urinary tract. And so could there be other gastrointestinal cancers associated with A exposure? And so we considered the potential um, potentially liver cancer. And so we worked with uh, the group from uh, the Genome Institute of Singapore, uh, my, my colleague Ken Song, we had previously published a whole genome analysis of uh, 88 liver cancers from Hong Kong. And uh, he, what we did was to ask the question, in the 88 uh, liver cancers, do you ever see any cancers that have the features of the A signature? And the answer was that when, we, when, when Ken did a uh, PCA comparison, there was one cancer that was a clear outlier in the mutation profile and this cancer actually showed the AA signature. A subsequent, more careful interrogation of this data set suggests that up to maybe 10% of, the, of these liver cancers may have some level of AA exposure as seen by the very unique mutation signature. So the result of this work that was just published two weeks ago in Science Translational Medicine just that uh, AA UTCs exhibit a higher mutation rate than any other cancer caused by a known type 1 carcinogen, including use of the light and smoking and tobacco. The AA mutations occur at ATPs and is preferentially target an extended sequence motif. Uh, the mutations occur preferentially at splice sites, and by looking by using that extended sequence motif to query cancer genome data of other cancers, we were able to link other cancers to A exposure, and hence this is a pioneering example of the use of mutation signatures to infer new carcinogen exposures. Uh, I will end my talk here with the acknowledgement slide. All of this work was performed in very close collaboration with uh, Professor Dave Bing Tian and Professor Steve Rosen uh, in Singapore. Uh, we have a joint cancer genomic program. Uh, Zhang Zhijiang was the lead author uh, in the gastric cancer work. Uh, Hu Ji Kyung was the lead author on the Netbar Dynamic Pillar T cell lymphoma work, uh, Ong Chun Tian for the CCA work, and uh, Sung Wing Pong was the uh, lead author on the 
in a related type of work that was published uh, very recently. So I'd like to talk, stop there. I'd like to acknowledge funding from the National Medical Research Council, Agency for Scientific Policy Research, and internal grants from Duke and US, and the Cancer Society of Singapore. Thank you very much for your time. Um, if there are any questions uh, from the floor, I'll be very happy to uh, take them. Um, I will hang around for about perhaps five minutes or so, and then, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions.